So I'm Kai Horstman. I'm the author of Core Java. I've been writing this book for 10 editions since 1996, probably since <coughs> longer than most of you have been working with Java. So I'm going to be talking about Java 9, um, and we'll talk about you know, what's in the API, um, and we'll just focus on the good parts. Um, so we'll talk about collection literals, the Elvis operator, some new API settings of good things like streams and optionals, completable futures, the interactive shell, um, miscellaneous improvements, some trivia that I hope you'll find fun, pop quizzes, and nothing depressing at all, meaning I won't say anything about modules. All right, so um, I've been looking at the Java API for a good long time. Um, as <clears throat> and there's always these things that you want. Like in 2009, Josh Block, who you probably remember, uh, has proposed to put collection literals into Java 7 as part of what then was Project Coin. And so Josh said, you know, it's a shame that uh, unlike uh, real programming languages, that Java doesn't have any way of making sets and map literals. And so he proposed a pretty syntax. Here you have a literal list, here you have a literal set, and you have a little, little map. Looks great, right? Did we get it? Um, almost. This is what we got. So we didn't get syntax. We got some new methods. So now you can say list.off, which is nice, and you just list what you have in here. Um, of course, it's just like arrays.as list, but with a few fewer letters, so we shouldn't complain. Then we got this notation for set, set.off. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, with maps, it's a little funkier. You know, here we make a map, and we don't get like any arrows or colons or anything. We just list the key and the value and another key and another value and so on. Uh, but we're not complaining. If for whatever reason you don't want that, there's a second version of maps that's really only tolerable when you do a static import, and then you can say, I want to have a map of these entries. And then you list each entry wrapped in this entry thing. All right, well, that's what we got. So let me give you a pop quiz. You may ask, what's a pop quiz? A pop quiz is just like a puzzler, except it's unfair, because I'm not telling you enough information for you to actually figure out the answer. But we'll see uh, how it goes. So here I have a map. It's a map from strings to integers. Maps the month names to the month numbers, You know the kind of thing that you'd want to have. And I'm going to be printing out the map. So notice I'm using map.off. So what's going to happen? Now, what kind of map are we getting? Um, the first thing here would suggest that we'll just get a hash map. Now, where you can see the keys are kind of in random order. The second one here would indicate that it's maybe a tree map, you know, where the keys are in alphabetically sorted order. Not the most useful thing for a map of months, but whatever. The third one might be a linked hash map where they get put in into insertion order. Or maybe I made a typo somewhere and this doesn't compile. So, what do you think? Can I have a show of hands for everyone who thinks it's number one? So I see very few people who think that. How about number two? I see very few people. How about number three? Now, I thought number three was going to be the clear winner. How about number four? OK, and a few more people think it's number four. And let's see. Well, let's understand how these things actually work. So for a list, it's easy enough, right? Uh, there is a method of. And it takes a var args of elements. And that way, you can have any number of list elements. Um, for a map, that doesn't really work. Because when you think about it, let me show this over here again, that we have alternating types. The first thing is the key type. The second one is the value type, key type, value type, and so on. And you can't do that with var args. So what they did is they made a bunch of methods, map.of for an empty map, map.of with one key and one value, with two keys and two values, up to 10 keys and 10 values. Well, in our case, of course, how many values did we have? We had the month names, there was 12. And Larry Allison couldn't afford to give us 12 methods for map.off. So instead, we had to use the map.off entries format. That's what it was really for. And this thing doesn't compile. So number four was the right answer. Now, as a <coughs> aside, there are also 11 methods of list.off. And those are just there so that you don't have to uh, pay for the cost of packing the arguments in a var args array if you have a short list. So there you go. We now have these literals, and I'm sure we're going to be all using them with wild abandon. 
So um, I said before that, you know, really list.off, you know, why did they even bother to give us list.off? Because we always had arrays.as list. And so let's probe the difference between list.off and arrays.as list. So we have these two versions of uh, this uh, function here. Uh, and so one of them gets arrays as list, um, and the other one uses list.off. What does the function do? It, uh, it's, it's just some uh, uh, pop quiz stuff here, right? It doesn't do anything sensible. If the list doesn't contain Java, then we're going to add Java to it, because after all, every list of strings should have Java in it. Um, then we sort it, and then we print out the result. So I would like you to ponder with from what you know, um, do both of these versions work correctly, whether you use arrays.as list or whether you use list.off? Maybe version one is okay for some arrays, maybe the ones containing Java, but version two wouldn't work at all. Or maybe version two is okay for arrays containing Java, but version one just isn't gonna work. And the fourth option is neither version runs correctly for any array. So let's do the show of hands thing again. Who thinks that both these, these versions will work perfectly for any array? Well, I don't see anyone who thinks that. Um, how about version one? Who thinks that arrays.list has a fighting chance here provided that Java is in the list. So that doesn't seem to be a popular op option either. Who thinks that, that lists.of is the winner here? We don't see that either. How about that neither of them works for any array at all? Um, so a few people think that. Well, let's think this through. So lists.of, and I didn't tell you that, that's, it, that's the part of the fun. Lists.of is immutable. Um, so it produces a list that, that you cannot mutate at all. So clearly, this isn't gonna work, right? Be uh, <clears throat> because you can't add something to an immutable list. Well, that's why I said, you know, what if the list doesn't uh, already contains Java, then this stuff wouldn't be executed. Well, what about collections.sort? Um, what if the list is already sorted? And so I actually had to look that up. As it happens that um, even then when the list is sorted, the thing that list.of uh, re returns is some internal type, and that type defines a sort method that immediately throws an uh, unsupported, not supported operation exception, so that's not gonna work at all. Whereas arrays.as list, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, you actually can sort the return value. So arrays.as list has, is, is a weird construct that we will probably never again see in the API, where you have a list that is modifiable but not resizable. That's how in Java 1.2 these things worked. And so in 1998, when Java 1.2 was developed, the concept of immutability was really strange to everyone, and so they tried to make these as mutable as possible. Now it's 2017, and so we're familiar with immutability, and it's no longer a big deal. All right. Um, there's a bonus feature in here, by the way. Um, as you know, Java has no way of doing pairs. There's no pair class in Java. If you want to have something that has uh, just two, th two values in it, you could, uh, an array that only works when they have the same type, and so otherwise you just write your own pair class like everyone did. Uh, why, don't, why aren't they giving us a pair class? Well, I keep asking that and um, they tell me they're waiting for Project Valhalla where we get value types. Because of course tuples are more effective as, as value types than they would be as reference types. And so eventually we will undoubtedly get pairs and tuples, but not right now. Um, now I've seen people, um, in fact I just had to deal with that a couple of weeks ago, um, who, who use map.entry as a poor man's pair. So I had to put something into a list of map entry string strings um, to, to sign some OAuth request. And I thought that was a true pain because how do you make such a thing? So I, it turns out that the only class that I could find that implements map.entry is abstract map.simple immutable entry. And so I put those in there and it did work. But hooray for Java 9, now I no longer have to do that. Now I can just call map.entry. So if you have to use an API that uses map.entry as a poor man's pair, you will appreciate that. All right, enough about that. What else are we getting <coughs> that will make our life more satisfying? Um, you know from Groovy, there is an Elvis operator that if you have something that might be null, then you can say, well, um, use it use the thing that if it's not null and otherwise use the, the other thing. I don't know why it's called the Elvis operator, but whatever. So in Java 9, well, uh, we've been had to wait for over 20 years for this, but now we have it. We are getting a method that lets us do the same thing. And it has a really catchy name. Objects dot require non null else. So with only 22 letters, you can do the same thing. And you say, you know, if this thing is not null, then use it, otherwise use this replacement. But there's more. 
So you can even lazily compute the alternative with objects that require non nulls else get. So you may wonder who comes up with a name like objects dot require non nulls else get. Well, there is an insidious plan in here, my fellow programmers. This is all done to make the optional type look good and to make you actually use it instead of nullable variables. Because if you have an optional, like here, let's say that person.name returns either an optional, it returns an optional string, either the name itself or a <coughs> nothing, if there's none in there, then the API becomes much simpler than you can just use good old or else. So there is now this idea that um, we want to do more with optional. And in fact, if you look at the API, there is a whole bunch of methods that now return optional. You've seen optional in streams, but now it's also in the HTTP client, the service loader, the runtime version, process handles. So every time that they add a new API, they actually say, hey, we should be using optionals and not nullable variables. So that's a good thing. We also get a couple new methods in optional. So here is a uh, method that Notice the, the trend here. This method here is as short as possible. Or, not none of these, or this or that or something else. So what does or do? It can combine two optionals. So if you have an optional and another one, then it picks either the first one if it's there or the second one. Except the second one is lazily produced so it actually gets a supplier of that. So that's what it does. Um, there is another useful method. You may recall that there is an if present. Um, if present lets you take an optional and then pass it on to some method that does something with it. Uh, it's kind of like a, the if version, uh, the if statement for optionals. And now we have an if present or else where we get an if else for optionals. So either if the thing is present, then you pass it on to this consumer, or otherwise you pass it on to this thing here. And so, you know, it's, which does what should happen if it wasn't present, it just removes the home directory. Um, finally, there's a kind of weird looking method that you can now turn an optional into a stream of length 0 or 1, something that you've always wanted to do, I'm sure. When I first saw that, I said, why the heck would I want to have a stream of length 0 or 1? Um, there's exactly one reason why you want this method, and that is you can combine it with flat map to drop empty results. So let's say I have a stream of person objects from somewhere. And now I'm taking, now I'm mapping it with person name. That was this method that returns an optional. That optional might be empty or it might have a string in it. And now if I flat map with optional colon colon stream, that's a useful idiom. What that basically says is that if this thing here had a string in it, then we're going to be getting the string. If it had nothing in it, then it just gets silently dropped. So this way, we're removing all of the ones that, that aren't there. So you just need to just remember this, this idiom um, if you ever need to do that. And it's optional, enters the API more and more. So you probably will need to do that. So here's a bonus feature. I gave you this little cheat sheet. I always find these method names confusing, so I've just put them together on this cheat sheet. There's really, uh, remember when you have an optional, that under the pain of death, you should not use the get method on it, and you should also not call is present. Um, this really, Three things that you can do with an optional. Um, you can grab the data. And so when you look at them, here you, see, you can see that the methods are actually sanely named, or else, or else get, and or else throw. So those existed in Java 8. You can do an if and then else with lambdas. So you have if present, which was there in Java 8. And then you have if present or else that was added in Java 9. And the third thing, and that's something that we're all learning how to get better at, is you can actually use uh, transformations and uh, on an optional. So if you have an optional, you could maybe f check whether it fulfills a certain, certain condition. So that's you do with filter. Um, and you can then transform it with map. And then if you get a null result, you can substitute an alternative with or. So this kind of functional style programming is something that, uh, that we're going to be seeing more as, as we'll learn how to, how to do this. All right, so that's optionals. Um, how about streams? So just like with optionals, you now see lots of API methods with streams. So we'll go through a few of them later in this talk. You see in the scanner, matcher, service loader, local date class has, gives you a stream of dates between uh, one local date and another one. Um, new class like stack walker, class loader has been retrofitted to give you streams, uh, the process API and so on. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting. So there's a common theme here that um, from now on, you'll always be 
giving a, is, you'll always be given a stream if it is advantageous to be lazy. So whenever something is maybe expensive to produce, maybe not likely to be consumed until the end, in that case, the APR will want to give you a stream. Um, <clears throat> here's another useful new thing about uh, the API. The files.lines method, which you may recall gives you a stream of all of the lines in a file, now uses memory mapping. And that is very useful because let's say that you have a largest file and you want to produce the lines in it. You might want to use a parallel stream. But if you think about it, a parallel stream on a bunch of lines that are read in one at a time just isn't going to work, right? How is it going to parallelize it? Whereas if it uses memory mapping, then of course it'll work just fine. You can, uh, the operation will split nicely. Uh, some part of your parallel computation will work on one part of the file and some other will work on the other part of the file. So you can now start using parallel streams um, in this one situation with an, what otherwise looks like an IO bound operation. So that's welcome news. So a couple of new stream methods. There's a take while and a drop while. So take while will just take the initial part of a stream while a condition is true. Drop while will take, do the exact opposite. I have not yet found a use for them, but maybe you will. Here is a method that I have put a use. Um, um, there is a st stream that iterate method that lets you produce an infinite stream, um, which I've never found very useful except for silly examples. And now you can have a finite stream, which is much more useful. So if you have some kind of a criterion that lets you start with one, one element, here I'm starting with big integer zero, then I you know, keep adding one, so now I get all of the big integers, this would be an infinite stream. But in Java 9, I can now put in a condition and say, just only do this while some condition is true. So that gives you the finite stream. So that's, that's a nice enhancement that uh, I don't know what took them so long. There's a couple of new collect collectors. Um, remember how collectors work. Um, so here I have a stream of city objects. And now I'm calling collect with one of these downstream collectors grouping by. So I want to group the cities by their state. So what I get out of this is a map that has as key the states. And as values, it has the sets of the cities that are in a particular state. But now I'm concerned about that. I want to not have like small and useless cities. So I only want to have cities whose population is at least a half a million. Um, and I can now, in Java 9, use this filtering downstream collector to do that. Now you might say, who needs it? In Java 8, I could have just used cities.filter and thrown away small cities from the get-go before collecting them. And there's a teeny tiny difference between these two, that with the approach that you see here, if I have a state that has no large cities, then I get an empty map, uh, sorry, an empty set as the value for that. Whereas with the previous one, then the, the key wouldn't even have been present. Now, if that difference is important to you, then you'll enjoy using these two methods. And that's really all that we've gotten for streams. So those of you who've been working with streams, you know that the one method that, of course, we all want is zip. And we're not getting zip yet because we don't have value types. Zip doesn't work well without value types. So we're going to have to be waiting for a project Valhalla again. All right, that's streams. Now, here is a feature that's likely to be a crowd pleaser. We've been waiting over 20 years for this. That, you know, you have an input stream that you get from some inconvenient source, such as url.openstream, and now you need to read all the bytes in that in input stream. What do you do? Well, until Java 8, everyone had to do the same thing, right? You go to Stack Overflow, you type in, how do I read all bytes from a stream? There's these three damn lines of code, you copy and paste them, and you go on with your date. Um, so you no longer have to do that. Now you can boldly call read all bytes, and it does what every single other programming language on the planet has done from the get-go. It reads all of the bytes from an input stream. So that's great. There's also read n bytes if you just want to read the first n bytes. Um, similarly, if you need to copy all of the bytes in an input stream to an output stream, you no longer have to, to look that up in Stack Overflow. There's now a method for it. So it does make one wonder, by the way, why does it take forever? 
for the API folks to give us these simple convenience methods. Um, and every time I ask that question, um, the folks at Oracle say, oh, it's just an unimaginable cost of testing all of this and rewriting the test suite and all that. I, I think that's kind of bogus, but uh, so it, it is a, a bit of a flaw of the Java API that if a simple thing has not been added on as soon as the API saw the light of day, then it can just take absolutely forever to get retrofitted to it. We see, see that here. Um, <coughs> here's an, another welcome little tidbit. Um, if you process input, you'll know that scanner is maybe not a fast way of doing it, but certainly a convenient way. And now we have another convenience method in scanner. So scanner.tokens will um, get a stream of all of the tokens. Um, that's particularly useful if you take the scanner and you use use delimiter to have a custom delimiter. So over here, I'm having a stream of things that are separated by white space and a comma. And then I say dot tokens, and now I get all of the tokens in there, and I can use my usual stream processing foo to, uh, to keep on going with it. So that's nice. Um, so there's a couple other regex things that, that I like. So there is now, when you have a, a pattern matcher, then um, you can say, give me all of the results. And then you get a stream of match results back. Oops. Um, and so what, what's a match result? That's something that uh, was, oh, I don't know when it was introduced, but it's become um, more useful now. It's something that encapsulates a match. And so the first thing that you probably want to do with it is you just want to say, well, what is the thing that's matched? And for bizarre reasons, that's called group. And so if you just want to have all the matches as a uh, stream of strings, then you just match with match result group. So here, um, for example, I have a particular pattern. I'm going to find all of the matches and in, inside a path. So you see that there is a very simple thing to do that. Um, so again, it's, it shows that the stream API is getting to be used more and more for these kind of mundane results instead of writing with loops. Um, another convenience method in streams that, that is mildly useful. Um, so when, when you do replacements uh, with match results, then you can now interpose a replacement function. So over here, I am matching all of the words that have at least four letters. And then I can say, well, replace the, all of the matches, and here I turn them all to uppercase. So obviously that's, that can be kind of use, useful and concise. So if you work with regexes, as so many of us have the misfortune of having to do, then have another look at some of these uh, convenience functions, and you'll probably put them to good use. All right, so those were all you know, pretty tiny improvements. Um, there's some larger ones. Um, there's now, in the process API, there is a way of getting at the operating system processes. So previously, processes were uh, very weak because they had a lowest common denominator approach that you know, it should work on a smart card and on, uh, on Linux and Windows and whatever. So now they said uh, they'll give us more insight into what goes on in, in the machine. Um, there's a concept of a process handle. You can get a process handle from a process, from, from a PID, from the current process, or you can get them a stream of process handles from all processes in the uh, surrounding uh, operating system. So if you have a process handle, you can get information about the process, such as the PID, the parent process, the child processes, all the descendants, and some other information. This is this process handle that info structure. And from that, you get the command line, the arguments, when it started, the total CPU, the user, and all of that. Of course, if it is available, that's where the optionals come in. Sometimes it's available, and sometimes it's not. So my favorite method is on exit. Um, so now I have a process, and so here I'm doing something. I'm, uh, I'm starting the process, you know, presumably something that's a little longer running than, than just running LS. And then on exit gives me a completable future. Um, you may recall completable futures from Java 8. So these are those nifty things that are used for async programming. Um, I can say when this thing is completed, then run this, uh, this uh, method, or this, this Lambda expression here, and here I'm just uh, saying I'm all done. Um, it takes as its input the process handle. So if you have a long running process and you need to wait until it's done, then you now have an, a very convenient asynchronous way of doing it without having to call, uh, without having to block. So that's great. 
So here is another uh, nice API improvement. Um, you may wonder what's with the chickens. Well, I was told the conference is called Joker, so I should have funny pictures. Um, so, you know, so what's HTTP2 have to do with the chickens? Nothing, but they are in the jdk.incubator package. So for the very first time, um, now the API has a component where they specifically tell us, you know, we're trying hard and maybe it'll be good, but let us know how we're doing. And so instead of uh, giving us the best shot and not, then not changing it for 20 years, they say, you know, we want you to try this out and give us our feedback. So because it's in the incubator package, they make, uh, in a, I should say in an incubator module, they make us, and now I do have to break my promise and say one thing about modules, they make us um, put in a command line flag uh, in order to play with it. So you have to run, uh, you have to add this dash dash add module flag to, uh, to your build, and then you get to use it. Um, is it good? Well, let's find out. So, um, First of all, notice it doesn't have a lot of competition, right? How, how do you do, right now deal with HTTP? You have HTTP or connection, which is not anyone's favorite API, or you could then use uh, an Apache library that uh, was pretty good 20 years ago and then no one's changed it. So um, a more modern HTTP client API is, is truly very welcome. So it starts out pretty good. You uh, use a fluent builder. Uh, you say, give me a new builder. Um, then whatever parameters you want, you put in here with some of these fluent methods. And then at the end, you say build, and now you have, in this case, a client. Same for a request. So I have a builder for a request. I put in the URL. I say it should be a get request. And then I build it, and I have my request. Not bad. So then I want to send the request off. So that's what my client does. It sends a request. And I want to get a response. Well, what kind of response? they give us um, a body handler to format the response into whatever we want to have it formatted on, as long as it's a string, because that's the only body handler they're giving us. Um, so and there's, there's another one for byte array. So um, anyway, so, so here I say, OK, I need it as a string, and then I get it back as a string, and then I can take it apart. I'm not showing you that part. Now, that's OK. Um, but what's nice is it, it fits in well with async. So again. Now we're seeing the API embrace completable futures. And so I can say, I want this uh, request to be handled asynchronously. Um, and then when it's finally done, then I want to process the response. And I put in a lambda here with what I then want to do. So that's kind of cool. Um, what's also really nice about this being done with completable future, now I get all the other goodness of comp completable future. So for example, if I want to put in a, a timeout, then I can use this complete on timeout method, which is nothing to do with HTTP client. It comes from completable future. And uh, so I can say, well, you know, just substitute this response if the thing timed out after 10 seconds. Or I could also throw an exception um, uh, uh, if that happens. I can have a whole pipeline of responses. So all this completable future API ties in ni nicely with this HTTP client API. So I tried to put this to use. I had some old code that did some form processing. Did it work? No. Because the people who designed this thing, they come out of the Java SE group. So that's you know, the, the fundamental thing. And they've never heard of uh, HTTP forms. They literally haven't. I talked to the guy who did it. It was news to him that there is such a thing as uh, URL encoding for forms. So you still have to do that by hand. What about file upload? No. They have never heard of that either. What about JSON? I specifically asked that question. I say, hey, what about JSON? They say, well, JSON is not in the SE API, so we're not going to support it. So this is a great chance for all of you to kick the tires of this thing and tell them what you think of that and tell them they really need to support the web as it existed in 1990 and maybe also as it exists today. And then we'll get a great API in one, whatever one of the future versions is. Oh, and, and by the way, um, over here I used completable future, complete on timeout, and that is a Java 9 feature. I'm not mentioning in this talk anything about completable future. I have another talk this afternoon that, uh, that goes into more detail about that. All right, so that's the HTTP client. Nice to have. Um, when things come in, some things should go out. And so for the very first time, 
there's now an organized effort to kick stuff out of the Java API and to show that they're very serious about this. The deprecated tag has been enhanced. So there is now an attribute that says since the, when the deprecation started, and there's a for removal attribute. If that thing is true, that means they're talking business and this thing is gonna go sooner rather than later. So what has been deprecated so far? Java Util Observable and Java Util Observable. Does anyone here use those? I don't think I've used those for 20 years. Um, but no, they're gone, or they will soon be gone. Um, there was at one point an effort to deprecate vector and hash table, but they didn't have the guts to pull the trigger on that, so we're gonna have those for a little bit longer. Let's hope for the future. Uh, more seriously, object.finalize and runtime, uh, final, run finalize as an exit is now deprecated, and so my grandchildren may live to see it actually being gone from the API, um, but you know, you've gotta start somewhere. And that was always an ill-fated concept. So they're putting us on notice. Um, I was surprised to see this one, class.newInstance, because I actually used it a fair amount of uh, time. And I was wondering, why the heck is class.newInstance deprecated? What's wrong with making a new instance of a class? And the reason is that it has a behavior that I never knew in all these years that it has. When you call class.newInstance and the constructor throws a checked exception, class.newInstance is declared to throw no checked exceptions, but the checked exception nevertheless does get thrown. So it shows that the compile time safety of checked exceptions is, uh, was broken in this case. Um, and so instead you should call, there's a constructor new instance that doesn't suffer from, from that weirdness. Um, applets are deprecated. Does anyone use applets? Um, well, if you do, um, <laughs> um, my condolences to you and you won't be able to do it much longer. Um, and there's a bit of an SEE overlap with uh, this, uh, things like Corba and java.transaction and SE. And it's not gonna go over well if Java EE ever does uh, you get modules, so they're deprecating that part so that they can eventually shovel it into Java EE. Um, they give it a tool that actually has been there for a while, but now it's been uh, spiffed up that, that you can use to find deprecated uses in your code. So when I did that, for example, I found cluster new instance. Nice to have. So a couple of minor language changes. Um, was not easy to find a picture for this one. Um, everyone's favorite change, that underscore is no longer a valid variable name. So all of you who, because you don't want to type too hard, use underscore for unimportant variables, you can no longer do it. You can still use underscore within other characters, uh, but underscore all by itself is no longer there. So clearly they're uh, gearing up for using underscore in a Scala-like way for some wildcard thing. Um, try with resources can be used without having to declare a variable. In Java 8, Java 7, try with resources came in, you had to put a new variable into scope, and at the end of the try with resources block, then it was automatically closed. Well, what if it already exists? So here I have a print method, it gets a print writer, and then it prints a bunch of lines, and just as an example, and now I want to close the print writer at the end. Well, I couldn't use try with resources until Java 9. Now I can do it, I can put it in here, and then it gets closed automatically. I'm not saying this is great programming style here to necessarily close a stream that was handed to you, but you can now do it. So that's a minor uh, wrinkle with try with resources. Another thing that probably is not gonna find a lot of use is that, as you know, in Java 8 with interfaces, you have, what, default methods, static methods, and uh, you can now also have private methods and private static methods. Why would you want to have a private method in an interface? Obviously, no one can call it who implements that interface. Well, I guess you can factor out common stuff from your default and static methods into these private methods. I don't think it's gonna find a lot of exciting usage. Uh, it's just there because one can. Um, the rationale here is that a private method, since obviously it can't be overridden, um, there's no reason not to have it in an interface. So I'm gonna move on to talk about a little bit more like, propeller head stuff that I, was just, I just thought was interesting to see what kinds of things go on uh, when a new version gets produced. So just to, sh to show to, you know, what some of these people are thinking about. Um, so the safe var args annotation can now be used on private methods. So when I read that, I must confess, even though I have 
written before about the safe var args annotation. I had to look up what the heck that thing was good for. So remember what safe var args is there for. That you use it when you have a var args parameter, like you have here, and <coughs> you want to, uh, you want to make it so that it can be used with arrays of generic type, because generally there is a, a hole in the type system that says that if you have a var args, that, that that array, if you were to return it, then you could declare an array of generic types, which for obscure reasons that I'm not going to get into is not legal. So the safe var args annotation says, hey, I'm just reading from this array. I'm not ever going to give it to someone else as a, uh, an array that could potentially contain uh, generic elements. So previously, you were able to use it on static and final methods and on constructors. And now you can also use it on private methods. Hallelujah. So why this change? Because what do static, final methods, and constructors all have in common? The one thing they have in common is that, that you <coughs> cannot uh, override them. And private methods have the same characteristic. You can't override a private method. So they could have done this years ago, but now finally they, they did it uh, just, to, just because they can. So someone cared enough about this to add this in. So here's another uh, kind of weird feature that I didn't know, that when you have an a generic type, and now you want to form an anonymous subclass of it, which you know, is merely not something that one does a lot, but here I have an array list, and so this array list, I'm overriding the get method to always return Java. Yeah, why not? And so I'm making this as an anonymous class, and in Java 8, this code would not have compiled because notice that I'm using a uh, diamond operator here. In Java 8, you weren't allowed to do that. In Java 9, you can use this notation with a diamond for anonymous subclasses sometimes. And I'm not going to get, get into when. So there's some deep type theory that says when the compiler can actually infer this diamond. So great. Uh, again, I don't have no idea what possesses someone to go into this level of detail to, uh, to enhance uh, the, the language, but they did. Also, there's a number of really obscure compiler errors. So I went through this list of all of the various changes that, that they publicly uh, uh, <coughs> advertised. And so I'll give you an example that shows then how the compiler sometimes does weird things. So here we're having a map. This is a map from a type X uh, to some type that might be a subtype of X. And so if the, if the values of the map have the same type as the key, you could ask yourself, well, does it ever happen that the key equals the value? And here, if it does happen, then we'll increment a count. So I have this, uh, this, this method, whatever. Now I define a table class, and I say, well, a table is something where the key and the value type are the same. And then I want to have a method where I do the same counting thing. And here, I don't want to have to mess with, uh, with another type parameter, so I say it just should be a table question mark. And then I just call this method. In Java 8, this thing failed with a crazy error message. It's perfectly correct code. It was correct in Java 8. It was correct in Java 5, for that matter. But up to Java 8, it failed. I have no idea why they found that out, but there must have been some test case that someone complained about. And now they fixed it. So this is kind of the ongoing maintenance that you would expect from the JDK. The obscure stuff eventually does get fixed. So here's another thing that, that something happened. And so have a look at this code here. So I have an interface declaration. Um, and I have here one of those methods that you put in an interface. And there's something funny about it. And so ponder this. So this, this parameter here, is it legal to call a parameter this? This is after all keyword, right? Is it legal to call a method of an interface value? So what do you think? Anyone thinks that, that this is the problem? As, this was, this, if I call, as long as I call this that, I'd be fine. Anyone think that? No. Does anyone think that value is an illegal method name for an interface method? Well, no one thinks that. So does anyone think this is legal Java? Well, so then the right answer must be that Java 8 accepted it and Java 9 doesn't. And that is, in fact, what happened. So when I first looked at this, I said, yeah, this, this is pretty strange. Why would Java 8 have accepted something like this? 
because it makes no sense. Can you have a method parameter called this? Yep, you actually can have a method parameter called this. So this is a rarely known trivia fact that um, this was invented so that you can annotate method parameters. So over here I have a comparator method that wants to compare two person objects. And I want to make sure that the pe people are alive, otherwise I'm not going to compare them, and I have some annotation here. So easy enough with the explicit parameter here, I say add alive. What about the receiver? So in Java 8, it is legal to call that parameter with a special name this, that way the compiler knows that's the implicit parameter, only for the purpose of attaching an annotation to this. So whoever added that feature must have slung some code to make this now possible in Java 8. And then they forgot that when you have an annotation, annotations can never have parameters because they just return the annotation values. Uh, but nevertheless, that, that it did compile. So I have, again, no idea how they found that out, but they did, and so now you can no longer do that. So that's kind of weird. Um, here's another minor uh, change that, again, shows you what goes on in API maintenance. So look at arrays.as list. Um, you know, even though, who, who cares anymore, because now we can use list.off with fewer characters. We call two array. What does it return? So here I have an array, you know, three integers. Do I get an int array? Do I get an array of integers? Do I get an array of objects? Well, I'll tell you the answer in the interest of time. So as it happens, in Java 8, you got something different than in Java 9. So surely, you know, it, it should return an integer array because I'm putting in integers. But someone somewhere noticed, very belatedly, you know, that ever since Java, oh, I don't even know, Java 2 or something, that the two array method returns an object array and not an integer array. And then in Java 5 with generics, you know, they never changed that. And even though to, up to Java 8, it did return an integer array, nothing wrong with that, it's a subtype of object. Now they said, you know, what if someone actually takes the specification seriously and says, hey, it returns an object array and I want to put in a watermelon into slot zero? Well, hey, now you can. All right, um, a bit of version things. You know, the most shocking news of this entire presentation is when you call system.getProperty of java.version, it returns 9, or maybe 9.0.1, but it doesn't return 1.9.0. Right. So, um, you know, what do you want in a version number sch a scheme? You know, you, of course you kind of want to have something nice like semantic versioning or something, but it's also okay to have something that's crappy as long as it's consistent. Well, Java has a long history of making sure that theirs is neither. So, um, in fact, I had to update this talk uh, to put in 9.0.1 because that was just released. Um, and I, so I said, why, why doesn't it return 9.0.0? And so there's actually something in the spec that says that trailing zeros must be dropped. That's a totally insane thing to do because for how long is that gonna happen? So for about a month and a half, we had nine with no trailing zeros, and now we have 9.0.1. So that means anyone who processes version numbers has to say, well, because you might be in that month and a half, now you have to deal with, with that wrinkle. I don't know what goes on in whatever. Um, on the positive side, you now have a Java C uh, flag dash release that combines source target and boot class path if you want to uh, compile for a prior version. So now you can do dash release eight or dash release seven and this is guaranteed to work for a couple of releases back and you don't have to like keep your, uh, your old uh, libraries around. So that's kind of nice. There's multi-release jars that let you package uh, a jar file that contains uh, versions of classes for, for different releases that you know, is potentially a, a useful thing to have. We'll see how they work out in the wild. So, one more pop quiz. What do you think? is going to be the next major version number of Java. Is it going to be 1.10.0? Well, probably not. Is it going to be 10? Or maybe 10.0.1? Or maybe 10.0.2? Or maybe 10.0.3? Is it going to be 10? Or maybe 10 0 or maybe the marketing folks are going to go Roman numerals? Right? That's what we all want. And then we can debate, should it be pronounced X or 10? Well, we all know what it's going to be, right? 
It's going to be 18.03. Remember what I said about that it's okay to have a crappy scheme as long as it's consistent? Uh, so we'll see how long we have that scheme. All right, command line argument cleanup. So this is another thing that we've always wanted. Remember how, like Unix tools, they have a, a sane scheme that's been there forever? You have a short single dash option for something that's popular, like dash H. Or you have a longer option for something that's, you know, A, it's humanly readable, and B, if, if it's not a very common option, then you might not have a shortcut. So what about Java? Well, Java never had that. Java had these single dash options, such as good old dash class path that we're familiar with, except with JAR. JAR has you know, the archaic tar style options. And command line help for all of the various Java tools, sometimes they use dash question mark, dash help, dash dash help, and it was a confusing mess, and so this JEP said, enough is enough, we're gonna clean this up. All right, so now we have that options from the, in the future will have double dash and a long name, and some of them will have single dash and a short name. And so they even standardized how options should be specified. So if you have some, some option, you should be able to just put the value for that option behind it. Um, or, and again, I don't know what possessed them to do this. There should, should be an optional equal sign. Um, don't know why I would need that. Um, so with short options, you again can have the space, or you cannot have the space. So that's what they said. This is how it's going to be from now on. Also, single character valueless options can be grouped, just like in, uh, in Unix, dash EF is the same as dash E and dash F. So they basically said, from now on, options will be like in every uh, other command that, that you're used to. So, and this is not idle talk. They're really doing it. So, sorry that I have to mention modules again. So, with, with the module path is dash dash module path. And there's a short, a single character option for it, dash P. What about the class path? Oh yes, it's now dash dash class dash path. And the single character option is, uh, <laughs> I don't know, but it is actually dash CP. They couldn't use dash P because they used that for the module path, and maybe dash C didn't look pretty enough or was used for something else. I have no idea, but that's what it is. And of course, dash class path still works for backwards compatibility, and it doesn't wear out your, your hyphen key as much. So the last pop quiz of the day. So let's see which of these here actually work in uh, <coughs> Java 9. So I've tried this when rewriting um, the, the latest edition of the book. I said, well, we should you know, be thoroughly modern, use these modern options. So do you think this is going to work? So, uh, one person thinks it's going to work. Uh, OK. Here I have an option where I'm trying this, this dash f equals to see if that works. Here I'm trying to group a couple of options. And so I'll just tell you what it is. This here doesn't work. Dash dash jar is not supported. This thing here, no, it doesn't work at all. You get a confusing error message that says option not recognized. I don't even understand the error message. The third one, nope. It says dash f, file or directory not found. I don't even begin to understand how someone could write an option parser that would yield this result. So what did I have to do in the end? I went back to good old jar CVF. And actually, and I can't explain it, dash with a single dash here, it also works, um, whatever. So this is still a work in progress, and maybe our grandchildren will find that this goes to fruition. So what do I actually like about Java 9? Well, the one thing that I really like is JShell. I think everyone loves JShell. You know, I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, let me find JShell. So, I put in some Java expression, and it gives me the answer. Um, and so if you've, for whatever reason, if you've never used JShell, go and figure out JShell. Um, you'll find plenty of resources on the web to do that. But I just wanted to show you my two favorite JShell features that I think people don't really know. Um, so let's say that I type new random. And now, of course, I can run it, and then it puts it into a variable dollar two. And then I say, ah, oh, crud, you know, actually I wanted to put it in a variable that I give a name, but I don't want to have to retype the, yeah, I could now type, you know, random equals or something, but, you know, that sounds like useless work. So what I can do is I can hit shift tab, let's see if I can do this in the dark, followed by V, and then it puts in the type, and now I can put 
my variable name here, and I didn't have to retype the type. Oh, hey, thank you. That was nice, right? The same thing if I, let's say, I want to do something with duration, and so now I hit tab, nothing happens because it didn't import it yet, right? And I said, oh, crud, now I have to start again. I have to type the import. Not so. I can type shift tab I, and then it has a bunch of actions, namely, uh, which import I would likely want to have. Well, clearly, I don't want to have any of this Java FX stuff, so uh, it's option one. And now I can go on my mer merry way, and it's imported, and now it autocompletes. So those are two lesser known features there. The other thing that I really love is API doc search. So here I have the API documentation there we all love. And notice I no longer bother with that long tree here on the left. Instead, if I want to know something, say about duration, I type duration, and then it auto-completes, and I get here my API documentation. You know, just like every other programming language. So that's great. A um, couple of other minor features that we should all be grateful for. Resource files are now UTF-8. So you no longer have to, I'm sure for, for, for you in Russia, this must have always been a true pain if you had to localize something and everything was done with, uh, with these uh, backslash u constants. So now you no longer have to do that. Um, again, it's amazing how it took so long. Um, that if you call Java C with an option that has a directory like dash d dash s or dash h, Java C now actually creates the output directories. You know, it's amazing what, what one can do when you throw some attention at it. Um, also, the JDK no longer ships with Java DB. You may ask, what's Java DB? You no longer, no longer have to ask. Here's, they're working on Swing again. Remember Swing? So the JFrame class had a variable called exit on close, which actually was exactly the same as window constants dot exit on close, and it was never necessary to have them both. They have now removed exit dot on close from the JFrame, and now simply pick up the one from window constants. You don't have to uh, change your programs at all. It'll, everything will still work. That was the only change they made to Swing. But hey, it's better than nothing. Now here's one that we will all like, and that is that uh, we don't have to worry about modules too much, that we're still allowed to illegally access everything in uh, the JDK internals. We'll just get a nasty warning message. That, of course, will go away at some point. And finally, there's no big integer dot two. And so I think, yes, uh, well deserved applause for a big integer that too. And so no doubt that in 18.03, there will be a big integer dot three, and every six months they will add another one. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>